Well, praise the Lord. We're blessed to have you all uh, join with us today in our Wednesday night uh, prayer and Bible study. Thank you. I see Sister Alfred is on uh, right now. We pray that all of you who are joining us today is safe, uh, that is healthy, and that uh, all is going well with you and your family. I know that um, many of us can't wait until we are, are back in the church, into the fellowship of the righteous, uh, but uh, we just want to um, remind everyone that even though the building is um, closed, the church is still open. We're still yet ministering, we're still yet serving, and we're still yet worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me just thank all of you for all that you're doing for the kingdom work, all those that are praying uh, for our, our saints, especially our seasoned saints, those of you that are calling um, members, that are checking on them and uh, making sure that all their needs are being met, and uh, those of you um, that are still yet praying uh, for one another. Thank you so very much. And to all of the leaders of uh, CMBC, thank you for meeting us on our Zoom conference uh, roundtable on the other night on yesterday and uh, we look forward to when we do go and uh, prepare the building prepare ourselves uh, not only sanitize the building but sanctify our hearts and our mind as we be prepared to go back into the physical edifice to worship but we know that our bodies is the temple of the holy spirit thank you all uh, for joining us today and i see that you are coming online right now before we begin uh, let us just whisper a word of prayer uh, to the lord today and we pray that if you have a need, um, um, just shout it out, and um, we would definitely pray for you as well at the conclusion of this uh, Bible study. Pray with me right now. Eternal God, our Father, Lord, we just humbly come before you this evening. Lord, just thanking you, God, and blessing you, God, for all that you are yet doing. Thanking you, God, for your providence, your care over us. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for um, this another day that uh, you have made, Lord, and um, we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. We praise you, God, and we thank you for covering us and uh, blessing us and guarding our bodies, our minds, our spirits, our homes, our families, our children, our loved ones, and all those that are connected to us. Lord, we know that as Israel said, uh, if it had not been the Lord who's on our side, Lord, we don't know where we would be. So we thank you right now that you're yet on our side, that you're yet working, that you're yet um, in control of all that is going on right now. We plead the blood of Jesus over all of our frontline um, essential workers that you would, God, um, bless them and uh, guard them and keep them in, from all hurt, harm, and danger. We pray for every minister, every preacher, every pastor that yet ministering, and God, even uh, some that are tolling even more than others right now. We thank you, God. We pray that you would strengthen them and encourage all of them right now. And then, Father, we thank you for tonight as we study your word. We pray, Lord, that you give us wisdom and you give us knowledge in all of our getting. Give us an understanding that we can understand, God, what you're yet saying to your people in this special time, unprecedented, uh, extraordinary time that we're living today. We know that you're yet speaking and there's still yet a word from the Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for those that are joining us today from near and far, from Dallas to Forward, to Houston, to Navasota, to Colorado, to New England, uh, God, and to North Carolina. Wherever they are, God, we ask you, you bless them right where they are. We thank you once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for joining us today. And once again, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice. Let us rejoice and be glad in this. Let us shake off those... Um, spirit of depression and spirit of doubt and fear and let us just celebrate the, our lord and savior jesus christ for who he is he yet living he's yet ruling and he's yet reigning he understands what we're going through right now and he holds this whole world in the palm of his hand so thank you cmbc family for your love and for your prayers thank you for your service thank you for your work your labor that you are yet doing right now in these extraordinary times we're living in today Amen. I feel the spirit of worship and praise in me right now. And I just want to thank all of you for your continued support for the kingdom and for the cause of Christ and all that you are doing. Well, today we have a, a real blessed word from the Lord today. And um, our subject today is measure up, but I'm using the unifying topic, return to love and justice. 
return to love and justice. And this is what God is calling the people of God to do today. Return not to the building, not to the church, but return to loving uh, God the way we should love him. Uh, and then also to treat our brothers and sisters the way we should treat them. And so this is the unifying topic I am using today, coming from the book of Hosea, one of the minor prophets, the book of Hosea. Now, when you study the book of Hosea, his name means the Lord saves, the Lord saves. And the whole theme of the book of Hosea is redeeming love redeeming love in spite of what Hosea is going to be uh, uh, charging, charging his people with today, God's people with today, and the controversy that God have with his people, uh, at the end of the day, it will be summed up in spite of all that, God loves us so much that he's going to redeem us. And that's enough for us to shout about today because many times in our life, we have been, we haven't recipro reciprocated that love for our Lord, uh, amen, in the same way he loves us, amen. We don't love him with all of our hearts, amen. And so we thank God today for that type of love. Thank you all once again that are joining us from near and far, the CNBC family. And let me just say before I get into the lesson, uh, and speaking with one of our dear saints, uh, mothers of the church, uh, Amy Merch, she said, Pastor, she really enjoyed Bible study. And she said, when the church do, do open back up, uh, that means the building open back up. Let us continue to have Bible study virtually. And yes, we will continue doing that. A Merck, amen. And Lisa, we love you all and to all of you that are joining with us today. Amen. In the book of Hosea, the 11th chapter and the 12th chapter, and we're going to be dealing with uh, a few of those verses in the 11th and the 12th chapter. I told you earlier that Hosea name means the Lord save. And the theme of Hosea is God's redeeming love, God's redeeming love. When we study the book of Hosea, throughout the story of Hosea, God has shown his commitment to the people of Israel, and yet they continue to both reject his love and disobey his commandment all throughout the book. The northern kingdom, as we know, is... Uh, Israel and uh, their capital is Samaria. And then he also deals with Judah, which is the southern kingdom and Jerusalem being the capital city. As we study these passages, in many ways, today's passage shows how God is lamenting the frustration of a people who continue to defile the meaning of worship. After all God had done for them, God was lamenting. He's frustrated with a people who was continuously defiling, amen, the worship of the Lord. So the prophet Hosea, when we study him, he lived during uh, a tra the, the tragic final days of Israel, the northern kingdom, before they went into exile with Assyria. And we studied the book of Hosea. The book uses a number of symbols to depict Israel's unfaithfulness on the one hand, but on the other hand, it uses these symbols as God's gracious, merciful, and persistent, loving, loving character on the other hand. Hosea uses marriaging, marriage and parenting as metaphors. Israel, he uses as a promiscuous wife and an ungrateful or stubborn child to show the people's unfaithfulness. And he used these uh, uh, analogies, these metaphors, to illustrate his point uh, that while the image of the marriage being unfaithful and wayward wife is used in the opening chapters of chapter one through three, the metaphor of a rebellious child is used in the 11th chapter to depict Israel's disloyalty to God. Now we ought to, uh, oftentimes when God gives the prophet a word, God would all, always use um, uh, illustrations and personal relationship whereby the prophet can more uh, uh, intimately convey how God is feeling 
toward his people. In other words, they would experience some of those same things in their own life. Amen. If you're going to tell a story, you got to experience some of the same hurt and pain, rejection and rebelliousness uh, that we as parents and uh, uh, in our re earthly relationship, we can understand it a little bit better if we're going to tell that message. And so God uses that. Today, I'm going to deal with four uh, topics of four bullets. The first one is Israel's deliverance. Israel's deliverance. That's in chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And then the second bullet I'm going to use is God's reaffirming love. That's in verses 7 through 10. And then the third bullet is the punishment of Israel. That's in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Then the fourth bullet I will use is seek God's love and justice. That's in that sixth verse in the 12th chapter through the 14th verse. Amen. I know that you got it by your amen. Thank you all once again for joining us. Amen. My mother's on the line. Thank you. Amen. I, I see many of you on the line with us today. Amen. Um, my cousin Misha from Houston, God bless you. Thank you for having us online. Reverend Booker, amen. Uh, Corey Arrington, thank you. Shirley, uh, Shirley Arrington, thank you for joining us here today. The first thing I want to deal with today is Israel's deliverance. That's in verses 1 and 2. Notice what the prophet says. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. Notice what the prophet Hosea is saying to the people of God at this special time in their history. The Lord calls to remind to, to mind. Uh, his fatherly dealing with Israel and their stubbornness and rebellious rebellion against him. Notice in the text, well, here we have a picture of a father's tender love for a child. The Lord as a father and Israel as the child. Notice in the text, the Lord as the father and Israel as the child, a picture he often employs to describe his relationship with Israel. Notice what he says. He uses the phrase, when Israel was a child, then I loved him. Refers to the formative years of Israel as a nation down in Egypt. And after the time of Joseph and his generation. Notice what he says. God says when they was in their formative years, when they were just beginning, when they were just a child, God said, I love them. The effect of God's love and affection for Israel is both implicitly and explicitly stated in this text. First, he says, implicitly, he states, then I loved him. And that implies the Lord blessed Israel economically he blessed them numerically. They multiplied uh, 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 even after the, the death of Joseph and his generation, according to Exodus, uh, the first chapter, verses 6 through 10. The Egyptians, you know, they were envious and they made them go into, uh, put them in uh, uh, being a hard taskmaster over them and all these things. But God says when they were in their formative years, God says they was in a bad situation, but God brought them he called them out of Egypt. It was the Lord's miraculous hand that brought Israel in their infancy before there was a great nation. God called them out of Egypt. They didn't get out of Egypt on their own. Egypt is a type of the world. Egypt is a type of a place of sin, of bondage. And God said, when you couldn't help yourself, I help you. I brought you out because I love you. God brought them out for a purpose. God brought them out, amen, for a reason. 
He told Moses, when go down there and tell Pharaoh, let my people go, that they may worship me on this mountain. God brought Israel out of Egypt so they wouldn't be like the other nations worshiping idol gods. And God said, I did it because I love you. Listen, my brother and sister, God brings us out of the Egypt of the world and sin because he have a purpose of calling on our life. He know the thoughts. He know the plans he have for us. Thoughts of good and not of evil to bring us to that expected in. So God brings us out. God delivers us out of Egypt. He demonstrates his love implicitly toward us. He brings us out of Egypt. Amen. Because God has a reason for redeeming us. That's implicitly. Then explicitly, uh, the text tells us God expressed or demonstrated his love for Israel when he redeemed them from bondage down in Egypt. And I told you Egypt was a type of the world. Egypt is a type of sin. And God brought them out because they could not be all that God have called them to be in the land of Egypt. And so God brought them out of Egypt because they were going to be his peculiar people. They were going to be the apple of his eye. And God brought them out and God redeemed them because he loved them. And listen, God is speaking through the prophet of Hosea, telling his people in the midst of because what they were dealing with right now, they were dealing with a lot of economic uh, uh, boom and they're going through a whole lot of stuff. Amen. They, they was prospering. They were successful, but God was not pleased in the way they were prospering. They were not treating one another right. Uh, they were defrauding the poor. There was no social justice going on. And God is not pleased with that. And on the other hand, they're doing that, and yet they think they bless. And God had reminded them that he was the one that brought them out, that brought them up and delivered them from the house of bondage, from the house of Egypt. Amen. When they couldn't deliver themselves, God delivered them. Amen. Listen. God said that he did it when they was a child in the emphasis, when the, in their formative years, God went down in Egypt and called them out. But notice what the text says. And as they called them in verse two, as they called them, so they went from them and they sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense and graven uh, to graven images. Listen, Israel did not appreciate or reciprocate God's love for them. And that is indictment upon the people of God. Amen. God have redeemed us. God have saved us. But yet we don't appreciate it. We complain. We want to be like everybody else. We want to be like uh, our neighbors and people that don't know the Lord. We want to uh, be like them. And God saying to Egypt or to, to uh, Israel, you did not appreciate nor reciprocate that same love that I have for you. Notice what it says. Rather, the more he loved them and called them, the further they wandered away from him and worshiped images of Baal. That's in verses two through four. It says the translation uh, of verse two appears to be a little problematic because it, it renders as they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. Amen. They refer to the prophets whom God used to call his son Israel to return to him. That just simply means the more God called, the more God wooed them, the more they rejected him, and the more they went after other idol gods and graven images. Amen. Sometimes we get more excited about going north than we do then coming to church. And amen, for those who living in where I live, amen, you know what's up north, amen. Sometimes we get more excited, get more enthused about going um, to places, and, and, and but yet we don't get too excited about going to the house of the Lord. If you're a child of God and you're not longing to be in the fellowship of the righteous, if you don't miss church, something wrong with you. Amen. If you, uh, they're talking about open up the, um, the places where you go and gamble and stuff like that. And, and people are getting excited now, but the same people that are supposed to be Christians, amen, not getting excited about coming to the house of the Lord. Amen. You got to check yourself. 
and make sure that you're not worshiping idol gods, amen, and that these things don't move you more than worshiping God and serving God, amen. You ought to be excited, amen, about returning to the house of the Lord, amen, amen. Now listen, amen. He said, the more the prophets called them, amen, uh, so they went from them. The more they called them, the more they uh, uh, went away from them, amen. The more I called to him, the father, amen, the father, they moved from the Lord, offering sacrifices and burning incense to Baal, amen, and all these idols, amen, amen. And so God was not pleased with that, amen. God's main purpose for the Exodus was to separate Israel from worshiping idols and ex establish an intimate relationship with them. That was God's main purpose, amen, to separate them from idolatry, amen, and establish an intimate relationship with the people of God. God established, amen, this special relationship a long time ago with Abraham. And God said, not only would I establish with Abraham, I would establish with his, uh, his seed for generation and generations to come. And listen, when we recognize the reason why God saved us, he saved us to be peculiar people, uh, to be yeah, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, amen, a people that show forth his praise, amen, whom God had brought out of darkness of Egypt into this marvelous light. God has a purpose for why what he is doing to his people, amen? And that's why God is doing it. And God said, I showed this a long time ago, amen. Isaiah, the fifth chapter of Isaiah talks about uh, how much God loved his people. And Isaiah, the fifth chapter, uh, begin to say that in Isaiah, the fifth chapter, if you got your Bibles, amen, just turn with me real quick. Isaiah, the fifth chapter, verse one, Isaiah, and this is God speaking to the prophet of Isaiah, the fifth chapter, verse one. He says, now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my well-beloved touching his vineyard. He says, my well-beloved have a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And I digged or dug it and gathered out the stones and plant it in with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press in it. And he looked for it to bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Amen. God is, uh, through the prophet Isaiah, said, let me sing a song of my, of my uh, well-beloved. Amen. Uh, he, he talked about the vineyard of the Lord, which he loved. He said, look what I did for it. I dug it. I digged it. I placed it in a, in a very fruitful and productive, amen, uh, 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 a land. Amen. I put a fence around it. I protected. I did everything I could. It wasn't just a field or vineyard, uh, uh, what God is talking about. God is using this metaphor, speaking of his people. And God said, I look for them to bring forward, amen, some grapes, and they brought forward wild or sour grapes, amen. In other words, God looked for them to produce justice and righteousness, uh, but they produce uh, evil and wickedness and idolatry. And that's what God says about his people. And Isaiah prophesied uh, those same things. Amen. Amen. Now listen, I open up by dealing with Israel deliverance. God delivered them. God brought them back. God brought them out of Egypt. In their tender formative years, it was God that brought them out. And when God brought them out, amen, the more he called them, the more they went uh, running after idolatry and uh, worshiping ba Balaam and burning incense, amen, to graven images. And God was not pleased with that because God had demonstrated, God had showed them just how much he loved them, amen. This is not a message yet for Israel, it's a message that is even relevant for us today, amen. We are where we are because God brought us, amen. Where we are, God brought us what we know God taught us, amen. We didn't deliver ourselves, we didn't get here on our own, amen. God made a way out of no way, amen. And because of that, we ought to give him praise and we ought to give him all the glory, amen. Now, the second thing I want to deal with today is God's reaffirming love. God's reaffirming love. That's in verses 7 through 10. Thank you all for joining with us today. Amen. 
Hey, Mert, thank you for joining with us. We're so glad to have you with us today. We love you with the love of the Lord and all of you that are joining with us today. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tiffany Turner, for joining up with us today as well. Amen. We talked about, amen, God's deliverance in verses 1 and 2 in Hosea, the 11th chapter. And now we're in eleven chapter, verses 7 through 10. We're dealing with God's reaffirming love. We talked about God, uh, talked about when Israel was a child, he loved them. These their formative years before there was even a great nation, when they were just a small people down in bondage in Egypt, God delivered them. God brought them out, and the more God showed them how much He loved them and called them, they they the farther they went away from God. Sometime in life, the more God blesses us, the more we get off. We get uh, we you know we get off uh, a little beside ourselves. Amen. The more God do great things for us. Amen. Then we don't have time to worship him. We don't have time to study his word. Don't have time to uh, come to church. Amen. Uh, we don't have time to uh, uh, to spend uh, a quiet time with the Lord. Amen. When you know it's God that delivered you, that you didn't deliver yourself, that when you prayed in your uh, deepest, darkest hour, God made a way out of no way. Amen. Never forget that. Amen. That that we ought to reciprocate the same love that God have for us. Amen. Verses 7 through 10, we're dealing with God's reaffirming love. Verse 7 says, And my people are bent to backsliding. They are bent to backsliding from me. Though they call, though they call them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. Let me deal with that before we get to verse uh, uh, 8 through 10. In spite of God's tender love, the text says, And care for Israel... Uh, uh, and warnings because God warned them in, in verses three through four, uh, uh, five through six about their exile to Assyrian. Uh, uh, they refused to repent. God, uh, 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 God kept warning them, but Israel just refused to repent. Amen. The phrase he says, and my people are bent to backsliding from me is a statement of disappointment. God is disappointed by a father. It's a disappointment by a father who loved his children. Uh, it points back to the efforts God made to keep the relationship between him and his people of life. But the more he tried to make it work, the more they are habitually determined, which means bent, to walk away from God. Sometime in life, we got to, and, and God is using, uh, um, uh, the metaphor or the relationship between a husband and a wife and the relationship between a father and a son. Uh, Sometimes you can spoil your child so much and the more you give them, the more they want to walk away. And uh, the more they will disobey you. Amen. And sometimes it takes tough love. Sometimes it takes, amen, being a little stern every now and then for them to rec recognize that uh, in this relationship, amen, I love you simply because of who you are. Uh, but sometime in life, we can get spoiled by the goodness of our parents. Uh, sometimes we take advantage of even um, uh, a relationship. Amen. Some people just don't appreciate. Amen. Uh, you the way you ought to be appreciated or value you. And this is uh, uh, the background which God gave to the prophet Hosea to give to his people. Now, if anybody can understand this, Hosea could understand it. For the Bible readers that know about Hosea, we know that Hosea married a woman that was unfaithful, a woman that was uh, promiscuous, and uh, she had children of uh, promiscuity that Hosea found out that wasn't his biological children. But yet Hosea still loved them. Amen. And God gave this man that message to convey to his people. Amen. It's a hard message, but it's a message that says that God loves us in spite of all this, but yet God wants this love to be reciprocated uh, to, to him. Amen. So he says unto them, and my people are bent to backsliding from me, though they call them uh, to the most high, none would exalt, would exalt him. They are bent to backsliding. Amen. Which means they, their back are turning. Uh, in other words, uh, they were falling away. Apostasy. Amen. But notice, amen, God wants them to turn back to him, but they are turning away from him instead. Though they call them to the most high, they, it refers to the effort made by the prophets to turn Israel back to the most high. 
God's prophet kept pleading with them. And I said a few weeks ago, sometimes we, we're always looking for a man, a message from the Lord to make us shout, a message from the Lord where amen, make us dance. But sometimes God give us a message. It's a hard message, but it's a message to get us right with him. Amen. That we can worship him with, with, our, uh, with our whole heart. Amen. That we can give God everything. Amen. Uh, you know, the psalmist said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Amen. So God redeemed them uh, because he loved them. God brought them out. Amen. Now God is reaffirming his love uh, toward them. Amen. The more he called them, the more the prophets told them, exalt them. They refused to do it. Amen. They were just uh, bent on backsliding, bent on turning their back on the one who really loved them, the one who really cares for them, the one who delivered them, and the one who brought them out. Verse 8 uh, and 9 says, How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zimboam? Mine heart is turned within me. My repentance are kindled together. I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. Now, let me stop right here and, and, and get to the latter part of verse 9. It says that, for I am God and not man. Now, understand what God is dealing with right now. He is angry. He is upset through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah conveying the message how God feel about how Israel is treating him. And God says he's angry, he's upset, his wrath is kindled against them because they are worshiping idol gods and graven images. But God says, I'm not like you. I'm not like man. I would not totally try to destroy you. I would not totally try to wipe you off the map. Listen, if that don't move you, what God is saying, this is his heart right now. He's saying, in spite of all this, at the end of the day, I'm a redeeming God. I'm a loving God. I'm a merciful God. And I'm a gracious God. If somebody did you like that, amen, you want to, uh, in your fierceness, sometimes we would uh, want to do a tit for tat. We want to get even with them. But God says, I am not. I am not, I'm, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. Amen. So verse 8 and 9 is dealing with kind of like a spoiled child. Israel habitually turned away from God. They de deliberately uh, dishonored the Lord. Israel, justifiably, they deserved uh, the severest punishment possible, and God was obligated to fulfill that part of the covenant according to Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter, verses 19 through 20. But like a stubborn son who would not listen to his parent, Israel totally rebelled against God their father. But notice in the text, amen. God says that the earthly father give up his son, However, since God is infinitely just and infinitely merciful, the two attributes are seemingly in conflict. God says, I'm in a conflict right here. Amen. Uh, uh, he says, I'm, uh, uh, my heart is turned within me. My repentance, repentings are kindled together. God is dealing with a, a great conflict right now. And in the midst of this conflict, mercy wins out. Jeremiah says, the third chapter, it's because of uh, the Lord uh, loving kindness, his mercies that we are not consumed. They are new every morning. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. Mercy wins out in this conflict that God is talking about he's dealing with. Amen. Rhetorically, uh, as a father filled with love, compassion, and mercy, the Lord questioned Israel. Here are two sets of parallelism, a future a feature in common Hebrew poetry. The first is, give thee up Ephraim, in verse 8, with deliver thee Israel, 
And the second is, make thee Adma and set thee as Zebuim. Each of these refer to one action. Ephraim was the second son of Joseph, one of the northern tribes of Israel. Ephraim and Israel here represent the northern kingdom. And it means that all the inhabitants of the northern tribes are guilty. That was a breakdown of the discipline of the northern tribes. Therefore, all deserve to be disciplined. Israel rightly deserve this punishment. However, as the Lord agonizes on this and envision what the outcome would be, God's heart of compassion takes over. He says his heart has turned or changed or transformed, meaning he has changed his mind. The phrase, my repentance, or kindled together, expresses the intensity of his compassion. Praise the Lord. Thank God for mercy. Uh, thank God for his compassion. If it wasn't for his mercy, if it wasn't for his grace, none of us be able to stand here today. Oh, thank God today for grace. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God that they are new every morning because every morning we get up, we all need a brand new mercy. We all need a brand new grace. Amen. Now notice, amen. The question he posed in verse eight or answered in verse nine. The Lord affirms, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim. From verse nine. Here the Lord displays his characteristics of mercy and constancy. Amen. He seems like a change in God's action is in, in, in accordance with his eternal purpose of love and mercy for his people. In other words, in addition to deep compassion, faithfulness to his unconditional covenant with Abraham, amen, it motivates the Lord to spare Israel from total destruction. God said, I'm not going to totally wipe you off the map, even though you deserve it. How many know that God's justice is tempered with mercy? Amen. God's uh, uh, a chastisement, he tempers it with love and, and grace. Thank God today. It's kind of like a mother and father who is uh, disciplining their children. They're doing it not because they hate them. They're doing it because they love them. Amen. Amen. Back in the old days, amen, uh, the, uh, the parents, amen, and the uh, grandmother and grandfathers, amen, they did not spare the rod because they said, you spare the rod, you'll spoil a child. Amen. And so God temperates uh, 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 his uh, um, judgment, his, uh, his anger. He tempers it with love because, amen, it's all for a purpose. God wants his people to redeem and to repent and to come to love him the same way that he loves us. Amen. So he disciplined them for their sin. The phrase, the Holy One in the midst of thee, there in verse nine, the Holy One in the, in the midst of thee confirms his faithfulness and constant presence to protect and preserve them in keeping with his covenant. The phrase, I will not enter into the city means he will not enter the city as he did with Adma and Zebuim and destroy them in anger. And he's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. When God rained down fire and totally destroyed that city. And God says he's not going to totally wipe them out. Amen. Verse 10 says, They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the West. Amen. We're talking about God's reaffirming love. God is reaffirming to his people in spite of all that you have done, in spite of all your uh, rebellion and your rejection and your idolatry. Amen. I'm reaffirming that I love you. I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to chastise you because sin has a penalty. Amen. Disobedient do have consequences. But at the end of the day, I am correcting you to bring you back to me, not to push you away. So verse 10 says, amen, in the scriptures, God pronounces uh, of judgment is often immediately followed with a promise of hope. 
So in this case, in verse 10, uh, here, uh, Hosea prophesies a better relationship between Israel and their God. They shall walk after the Lord, which means they will follow the ways of the Lord in contrast to their former life of rebellion. God said they shall walk after the Lord. Amen. Thank God there is a message of hope in the midst of all that is going on, even in the midst of our rebellion, even in the midst of our correction, even in the midst of retribution. God says there is a glimmer of hope. There is hope for his people. And God said, they shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. Amen. Amen. They're going to follow after his ways. Amen. Then the Lord shall roar like a lion. Not in the sense of hostility for destruction, but as a signal and a call of return from their captivity. That means that Israel, yep. Yeah, they're going to go down in captivity, amen. The Syrian going to take the northern kingdom into captivity, and then the southern kingdom, Judah, is going to go into captivity uh, 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 with, uh, by Babylon. God has said, but there's going to come a day he's going to roar like a lion. It's going to be a signal call that your deliverance is here, amen. It'll be a signal call of return from the captivity, both physically from exile and spiritually from sin. When God deliver us, it's just not a physical deliverance. It's a spiritual deliverance as well. Amen. God physically brought Israel out of Egypt. Amen. But it took him a, a while to get Egypt out of Israel. Because when God brought them out, they still had a little idolatry in their heart. Amen. They still complain. Amen. They still murmured because they... Uh, some of them had got conditioned on living in Egypt. Amen. And sometimes, amen, we can get conditioned living in the world of sin that when God called us out, amen, God deliver us, amen. And yet it takes a, a while for us, amen, to get into that intimate relationship, amen, uh, where, where, whereby we can commune with God, amen, on a deeper and a higher level, amen. Praise the Lord. And I said the purpose God delivered Israel and brought them out of Egypt, amen, that he can separate them, amen, from worshiping idolatry and idol gods, but also, amen, to establish, amen, a special rela intimate relationship with them. And that's what God is uh, calling for his people to have today. Amen. To separate themselves, come out from among them and be ye separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Amen. But also to establish an intimate relationship with him. Paul said in the book of Philippians, the third chapter, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Amen. Amen. Yeah, in the fellowship of his suffering and being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul said that I may know him, amen, not know of him, but I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. Listen, if we want to know the power of the resurrection, amen, you cannot have a resurrection until there is a death. Amen. And when you die to yourself, amen, what Paul said in Galatians 2 and 20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And so the life I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God wants us to have an intimate relationship with him that in, when he call, we will answer the call. We can hear the signal. And whenever God speaks salvation unto us, amen, he is signaling to us, amen, your time of bondage is over with, amen. Then, uh, verse 10, they shall walk after the Lord, amen. They shall walk after the Lord, which means they're going to follow his word, his ways, amen. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and a stranger they will not follow, amen. Because why? You hear God's voice, you're going to follow his ways, you're going to follow his will, amen, amen. You understand what God is calling you to do, your purpose, God have for you in your life, 
Amen. And God love you. Amen. He not only love you, but he demonstrate that love toward you. Amen. Paul says in Romans 5 and 8, God commended his love toward us that while we was yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commended, God demonstrated, God showed us how much he loved us. Amen. In a love that uh, will not show you, will not act, ain't love at all. Amen. But God demonstrated the love toward us. And while we was yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't love us, amen, after he brought us out. He loved us right where we were. Amen. And that's the message of Hosea right now. The unfaithful wife, amen. And God is using this to illustrate how unfaithful Israel have been. And the more good, the more mercy, the more love, the more grace God showed Israel, the more they walked away. And, and many of us have been in a uh, situation like that before in our life, amen. And the more you love and the more you've given, amen, the more people didn't appreciate nor reciprocate that, amen. But God said, in spite of it all, I'm not like man. Praise the Lord. I'm not like man because I want the best for you. I want the highest for you. I love you and I'm calling you back to me. Amen. Well, the third thing I want to deal with today, amen, I'm not going to keep you long, amen, the third thing I'm dealing with today is the punishment of Israel. Now, we don't want to get, get to that part. We want to skip all over that, that God love us, stuff like that, but we want to deal with the correcting part. But God says there's a the punishment for Israel. And that's in chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. He says, Ephraim feed it on wind and followed after the east wind. He daily increased it lies and desolation. And they do make a covenant with the Assyrians instead of running to God. And all is carried under Egypt. Amen. They're making a, a, a covenant agreement uh, with Assyrian and Egypt. People that don't like them, people that hate them, people that want to destroy you. And sometimes we go make these pacts with uh, uh, friends and people who we think are our friends. They really uh, uh, don't want what's best for us. They want, what's, uh, they want uh, our downfall. Amen. Verse 2 says, The Lord have a controversy with Judah. God said, I got a problem with that. And I will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his doings, will he recompense him. Notice, Hosea continues God's charge against Ephraim. Ephraim, as we told you, amen, is Israel. For their waywardness, Using the figure of speech of when, Hosea describes Israel's pursuit of vain things and their false reliance on humans rather than their God. Notice what he says, Ephraim feed it on when means to eagerly strive for after empty or worthless things. In other words, they, uh, they were uh, uh, more trusting of their allegiance with Assyria and in Egypt, amen, uh, for commercialism and, uh, uh, and trading instead of trusting God. And God said, what you're really doing, you just, uh, you, you just feeding on the wind. It's empty. It's, it, it, it's useless. It's, it's pointless. Amen. Matter of fact, Assyria is going to be the one that's going to take you into captivity. And sometimes we're running with the, the very people that's, that, 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 that love to see our downfall. Amen. And God said it's empty. Amen. So he says the east wind he uses right here, but they also follow after the east wind. The east wind used figuratively here is particularly destructive uh, to this area since it blows in from the desert, bringing searing heat with it. It represents not only the pursuit of vain things, but the ruin Israel is bringing upon itself. It's not just the pursuit of uh, upon vain things and useless things, things that cannot help you, cannot redeem you. He says, what you're really doing, you're bringing your downfall on yourself. It's pointless. Amen. So verse two focuses on the sin of Judah, the southern kingdom. Although their sin seemed lighter, uh, Judah was equally guilty, that's the southern kingdom, was equally guilty and deserved deserve punishment. Now listen, the southern kingdom should have seen what was happening in the northern kingdom and they should have repented and went back to God, but they didn't. And sometimes we see the mistakes and things of other people, but yet we follow right in their footsteps. Amen. You can't blame uh, other people for your downfall if you follow after them and do the same thing. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now let me get to verse uh, 6 and uh, through uh, 14 because we're almost out of time. Amen. I want to 
uh, uh, be very um, uh, considerate of your time. Verse 6 says, uh, and, verse, uh, and this we're dealing with, seek God's love and justice. Seek God's love and justice. The last point I'm going to deal with. Verse 6 says, therefore turn thou to thy God, keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy God continually. After God lays a charge against Judah and Israel, Hosea calls on them for a change of heart and a change of direction. In other words, God says, repent. Hosea called them for a change of heart and a change of direction. Therefore, he says, turn thou to thy God. Turn thou to thy God. And listen, let me just share. I think in these um, um, really unprecedented and uh, extraordinary times we're living in today, I think God's calling for his people uh, not turn to the government, uh, not turn to um, uh, the doctors, but God is calling on his people the church, the believers, to turn back to him. There's going to be a new norm when we come out of this. Amen. And God is calling his people to, amen, for us to turn back to him and give our heart back to him. Amen. Uh, to worship him uh, in spirit and in truth and worship him with a whole heart. Amen. Give him the praise. Extol him. Exalt him where he should be. Amen. And these idols. Amen. We need to put away some idols right now. Amen. Amen. Uh, and we need to start worshiping God. You don't have to go to the building to do that. You can worship God in your home. You can pick your Bible up, get your mother, get your father, get your sister, your brothers, and you can have church in your home. Before there was a building, amen, they went from house to house. And now is the time for the families to come back together, for the people of God to have their prayer time in, in home together. Right now, since we quarantined, you ought to get around the table with your family and break bread and have prayer and look each other in the eye and put down all these smart gadgets, amen, and realize, amen, they're just making you dumb, amen, and start worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And these are the people that God are calling today. He says, amen, and here is an idea of changing a course of action, amen. He said, turn thou to God. He talking about cha change your behavior, a change of course, and a change of action. They have consistently wandered away from God, amen, uh, the God of their forefather, Jacob, and now he wants them to turn back to Yahweh, the Lord, amen, to do what, to do that would mean to keep mercy and justice. When you turn back to God, you're turning back to mercy and justice, amen. You're going to send some mercy out and I just want to mercy just to come into you. You're going to show mercy and forgive other people, amen, yourself, amen. Amen. Because mercy and justice are the very foundation of God's principles. Mercy and justice is the very foundation of God's principles. They are fundamentally required of all followers of God. Amen. They define a proper relationship with God Almighty. Michael said in Michael 6 and 8, amen, he has shown the old man what is good and what doth the Lord require to do justice to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. That's in Michael 6 and 8. He has shown thee, amen, O man, what is good and what God really requires, not to come to church and worship and, and all this other kind of stuff, but to do good and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Those are three things, requirements, the foundational principles that God is calling for all people, all men, amen, especially his people to live, be governed by, and to treat one another right, amen. Verse seven, he is a merchant, the balance of deceit are in his hand. He loved to oppress, and Ephraim said, yet I am become rich. I have found me out substance in all my labors. They shall find none iniquity in me, uh, uh, that were sin. Note what Hosea is saying. Hosea mentioned some of the uh, some of the sins the people of Israel had committed, using dishonesty and business. They saying that they are rich and all this other kind of stuff, but he rich by honest means and on, uh, dishonest means and dishonest gain. Amen. They did it by defrauding the people to make more money and pressing, oppressing the people. Amen. 
they were so self-sufficient and delusional that they would say, we don't need God. And sometimes we feel the same way. We get caught up in our riches, our cars, our homes, our bank account, where we live, until we say we don't need God. We trample over the, uh, uh, the, the less fortunate. We look down on people. And that's just not the world. We're talking about church folk, amen. Sometimes we are the same way, amen. We look down on other Christians that come into church because they don't have what we have. And God is saying, he's calling us back to him to justice, mercy, and righteousness. Amen, amen. Now listen, amen. God says in verse nine, and I that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles. And in the days of the, sol as in the days of the solemn feast, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied vision and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely they are vanity. They, are sac they sacrifice bullocks in Gilgad. Yea, they, their altars are as heap in the pharaohs of the fields. Verse 12, and Jacob fled into the country at, and Jacob fled into the country of Syria, and Israel served for, for a wife. And for a wife, he kept sheep. And by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet was he preserved. Verse 14, Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore, shall he leave his blood upon him and his approach shall his Lord return of him. Amen. They became so prideful. They became so delusional. But God says, I'm going to humble you like when you didn't have no home to live in, amen, I'll make you live in tabernacles and booth, like when I brought you out of Egypt, you're gonna be like a nomad, amen. You have no dwelling place, amen. I'm gonna make you dwell in tabernacles and in booths, as I did in the book of Exodus, amen. And he also goes on to say in verse 11, is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely they are vanity. Verse 11 seemed to confirm the degree of and gravity of their sin and idolatry and, and abject rejection of the Lord. And as an affirmation of their utterly depravity, the prophet poses a rhetorical question. Is there iniquity in Gilead? He answered his question, surely they are vanity. Amen. Sometimes we ask God, amen. Uh, uh, but God, would, you ask him, he will answer. Amen. He not only answer, but he'll show you. Amen. Every now and then we got to examine ourselves. Amen. And see, amen, if we are yet uh, uh, walking right and living right. Quit examining everybody else. We got to examine ourselves. Amen. And, and, and uh, 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 check ourselves. Amen. And before we wreck ourselves. Amen. Amen. And, and, and he goes on and talked about how when Jacob fled into the country of Syria and Israel served for a wife. Amen. This is, this is a reference of Jacob's plight. Hosea tell Israel to remember their humble beginnings. God got a way of bringing you back. When you think you get too high, God got a way of bringing you down. Amen. And sometimes even in, in, in the church, amen, even sometimes churches think they ain't got too high where they don't need God and they become so delusioned in their own self-sufficiency. Amen. And sometimes, every now and then, and that's something this pandemic crisis ought to be teaching us right now. That's, uh, we, 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 we are dealing with things unprecedented. Amen. Uh, shortage toilet paper. People look up a hand sanitizer. People walk around with masks and yet people still walk around in arrogance. Amen. Like they don't need God. Amen. I'm here to tell you today, I need him because, amen, he is the one that delivered us. He is the one that brought us out from our early existence to this present hour. God is still God. He's still working. He's still doing great and mighty things. And we ought to give him glory and we ought to give him praise. And God is calling his people to come back to him. Amen. And, 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 and oftentimes we experience judgment. We experience correction because God loves him. Because whom he loves, he chasten. Amen. God loves us and he'll chasten us. And thank God for his chastening rod to call us back to him to remember that he's God to remember he's in control, and to remember that when God humbles us, he says, amen, under his mighty hand that he may exalt us in due season. God wants us to be the head and not the tail. He wants us, amen, to live in freedom and to know that he is our God. 
Amen. And so as we close here today, amen, return to love and justice. That's the only way we're going to measure up to the requirement of God. Amen. Mercy and judgment are the foundational principles of walking with God and being the people that God have called for us to be. Amen. Now, I gave you four points here today. Let me just go over one more time. Amen. Um, Israel deliverance. And from Hosea, the 11th chapter, verses 1 and 2, Israel deliverance. The second point I gave you is God's reaffirming God, love. God's reaffirming love. He reaffirmed his love, amen, with Israel, verses 7 through 10. The third point I gave you, the punishment of Israel. That's in the chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. And then seek God's love and justice. That's in the 12th chapter, verses 4 through 16. Amen. As I close today, my brothers and sisters, um, always seek God daily in every aspect of your life. Seek ye first, Matthew 6 and 30, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this other stuff you may be asking God about uh, 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 shall be added. Amen. Ensure that you are keeping God at the head of your life. And you ought to ask yourself, what are you faithful to? What are you committed to? What do you find yourself idolizing? You can also examine if the blessing that God has provided you should be redistributed to those around you in need. How many of you know that when God blesses you, your cup ought to run over? Hallelujah. Amen. Lastly, seek to trust God to continue being a provider in your life and to trust uh, him in your, uh, and not to trust in your own ability to provide. Amen. Don't become delusional. Think that you're self-sufficient. Trust God. Amen. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into the own understanding all thy ways. Acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Amen. Praise the Lord. Return. Return. Praise the Lord. Now listen today, my brother and sister, return to love and justice. I hope you've been blessed by today. I hope that you've learned something by today. Amen. It is a word not only to Israel back in, in, in these times. It was the word for the people of God that is yet uh, pressing and relevant today. God's people need to return to love and justice. Amen. Thank you all for joining with us today. Amen. Thank you to all my cousins from uh, Navasota. Thank you for joining with us today. Amen. We love you. We praise God for you. I can't see all the names. Amen. But I lift all of you up and I praise God for your continued support and your prayers. Amen. Sister Minnie, God bless you. We praise God for you. Thank God for you and all that you do. Amen. For the kingdom. Amen. Thank you, uh, cuz. Amen. We love all of you. CMBC, we love you with the love of the Lord. Amen. Be strong. Be encouraged. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And know that this too shall pass. Amen. Shall we pray? God, our Father, Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you. We lift you up today. Thou art the God who did yet deliver us from all of our sin, delivered us from the Egypt uh, mentality. Thank you that even right now, that every day you're reaffirming your love, your mercy, your grace. And God, thank you for guiding us and directing us in the right way. Thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that even right now, God, that uh, sometime in the midst of chastisement, sometime in the midst of correct, correction, God, thank you that you're drawing us closer to you. We humbly, God, submit, that we admit that we can't make it without you. Bless right now all of the listening audience, the, the viewing audience, all those that came on board today to study this powerful word today. Bless them from near and far, from Navasota to Houston, uh, to North Carolina, God, um, uh, to Dallas, Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, God, uh, the, the Colorado, God, England, God, thank you for all of them, North Carolina, God, we praise you for them, and God, we pray that uh, you will bless our homes and our families, and uh, Lord, till we meet again, we'll forever give your name the glory and all the praise, we thank you and we praise you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. God bless you all, we love you all, in the love of the Lord, have a blessed uh, evening, and continue success and health for you and your family. God bless you all.